Hello, and welcome to episode 1 of Chemistry in 15 Minutes or Less. My name is Audra, and this is going to be a video series used to review for the curriculum in my honors chemistry class. It goes by chapters as well as parts, and aren't always in the seemingly correct order. But in order to keep this opening brief, this is the first review lesson on chapter 1, Matter and Change. In order to do any of these review lessons, the first thing we need to understand is, what is chemistry? Chemistry is defined as the study of the composition, structure, and properties of matter, the processes that matter undergoes, and the energy changes that accompany these processes. In order to study chemistry, scientists do three main types of research. Basic research, applied research, and technological development. Basic research is any research with the goal of increasing knowledge. These don't have commercial ties to it, they're just basic questions that you want answered. This could be something like what are protons, neutrons, and electrons composed of? Applied research, then, is research used to solve practical problems. This could be something like finding a cure or treatment for a common disease, or some sort of solution to an agricultural problem. Now, technological development is using existing knowledge to make life easier or more convenient. Now, to think about that, just think about the computer or tablet or whatever you could be watching this video on, or something as simple as refrigeration. Using these three types of research, chemistry is broken down into six main areas of study. Organic chemistry, biochemistry, physical chemistry, theoretical chemistry, inorganic chemistry, and analytical chemistry. Now, organic chemistry is the study of almost all carbon-containing compounds. Not all carbon-containing compounds are considered organic, and we'll talk about that in a later lesson. Biochemistry used to be a subset of organic chemistry, being the study of reactions and compounds in living cells. Physical chemistry is the study of properties, energies, and reactions. Theoretical chemistry is the study of modeling and computers. This used to be a subset of physical chemistry, but it became so big it became its own branch. Inorganic chemistry is the study of all non-organic chemistry, pretty much. Like I said, there are things that aren't considered organic and organic compounds. That is the study here. And analytical chemistry, which is just the study of structures. Now, behind these six subsets, they all have one thing in common. Matter. It's the basic study of all chemistry. Now, matter itself can be broken down further than just saying matter. It can be broken down into two main subsections. Pure substances and mixtures. Now, a pure substance is a substance with constant properties and composition. It's fixed, it doesn't change. And it's uniform, which is most important. It means it's even. Now, a mixture is a blend of two or more pure substances, which each retain their own properties or identities. Now, it also does not have to be uniform in structure. These can be broken down even further, a pure substance into an element, or a compound, and a mixture into a homogeneous mixture, or a heterogeneous mixture. Now, a pure substance itself is homogeneous, and an element is a pure substance that can't be broken down into simpler or smaller substances, and a compound is a pure substance that can be broken down into simple smaller substances. Mixtures are homogeneous or heterogeneous, like I said, and pure substances are homogeneous. But a homogeneous mixture means it is uniform in composition. These are things like solutions, where you have salt or sugar dissolved completely in water. That's not to say it's a pure substance. It's a homogeneous mixture. A heterogeneous mixture is something that's not uniform in composition. These are things like suspensions, where you try to mix something like sand into water and it doesn't dissolve. You also have other subsections of matter, but something that can be related both to mixtures and pure substances. Atoms and molecules. Now we all know what atoms are, we've seen them in class. An atom is the smallest unit of an element that maintains the chemical identity of an element or a compound or whatever. Now a molecule is the smallest unit of an element or compound that retains all of the properties, as well as the aforementioned identity. 
So while we're on the topic of properties, there are two main types of properties. Intensive and extensive properties. An intensive property is a property that is independent of the amount of matter present. This means it doesn't rely on how much matter there is. This is something like melting point or boiling point, where you could have 10 milliliters of water or 100 milliliters of water. It's still going to boil at 100 degrees Celsius. You can remember this by noting that they both start with the IN prefix. Intensive, independent. Now, extensive, as you probably can figure out from context, are properties that are dependent on the amount of matter that is present. These are things like mass or volume or amount of energy. It'll change if you have 10 milliliters of water or 100 milliliters of water. That's already having a different volume. There's no real trick for that one. You just have to be able to remember intensive and know that extensive is the other one. The other types of properties you have are chemical properties and physical properties. Chemical properties are things where it's a substance's ability to change into another substance via a chemical reaction. This includes examples of things like flammability, corrosion, or decomposition. Now, on the other hand, a physical property is a property that can be observed without changing the physical identity of the substance. This includes things like density, conductivity, and color, or even state of matter. Something pretty simple. Now, aside from chemical and physical properties, you also have chemical and physical changes. A chemical change is where one or more substances are changed into another substance. Now this is your chemical reaction. Where you have, let's say, a combustion reaction where you have ethanol combining with oxygen to then form CO2 and H2O in the gaseous state. It's a chemical reaction, something's being changed. Now a physical change, on the other hand, are changes in shape or appearance, not in actual identity. This would be something like a phase change, like water boiling and becoming steam. To close us out, we are going to briefly gloss over some different types of elements. We will talk about this in a later episode, but we did mention this in class at this point in time. Now I have a neat little periodic table here to help me figure out metals, nonmetals, metalloids, and noble gases. Now in order to separate the periodic table, there's this nifty little imaginary line that goes through right here that separates the metals, which are over here, from the nonmetals, which are over here on your right. Basically, metals. Everything from this red line off to the left. They're shiny, malleable, ductile. They are also good conductors of heat and electricity. This would include familiar elements like iron, copper, zinc, even sodium, and silver are also considered metals. On the other side, over here, we have nonmetals. They're dull, brittle, and they're also not very good conductors of heat or electricity. This includes other familiar elements like carbon, oxygen, sulfur, chlorine, or phosphorus. And they're on this side of the table. Now, right where I have drawn the red line, there are six elements that are considered metalloids. They're semiconductors, so they're intermediate of metals and nonmetals. Now these are, in order, Boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium. Now they are on either side of this line, but they are what make up this line that divides the metals from the nonmetals. They're not transition metals, those are these here that we'll talk about later, but they are the transition from metals to nonmetals. The last thing to talk about is the noble gases, which happens to be period 18 right here at the end of the nonmetals. They are all gases at room temperature and are generally very, very, very unreactive. There have been a few instances of getting some of them to react, but the general gist is they don't react. Now these, as you can see here, are helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon.
The list does content extend down, as you can see, but since those are all the new elements and we don't quite have all the information on them yet, we cannot be 100% certain of their properties. But this concludes episode one of Chemistry in 15 minutes or less. Um, feel free to leave questions or suggestions in the comments below. Be sure to follow the in-video links, check out the playlist, or head over to my channel for more videos on Chemistry Review. And I will see you next time. Have a nice day.